Hello everyone and Happy New Year! Welcome to another video from QuickMed. Today we will be discussing neonatal jaundice, particularly elevated unconjugated bilirubin in newborns. Before you watch this video, I would recommend watching two other videos listed on the channel, the hemolytic disease of the newborn and the hyperbilirubinemia videos because they will give you some background that will help make understanding some of this information a lot easier. Alright, let's get started. When we talk about jaundice, it's important to know that jaundice is not a disease, but a sign of elevated bilirubin, and it's important to understand where this elevated bilirubin is coming from. Almost all newborns will develop a total bilirubin of greater than 1, which, if you remember, is the upper limit of normal in adults. The majority of cases of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia are physiologic or benign in cause. So why do we discuss newborn jaundice? What's the significance? The significance is that unconjugated bilirubin is lipid soluble and so it can cross the blood-brain barrier and bind to brain tissue. This can lead to bilirubin-induced neurologic dysfunction which has both acute and chronic complications so it's very important to try to prevent this from happening. Severe hyperbilirubinemia is defined as a total bilirubin of greater than 25 and this is when you start expecting neurologic symptoms to develop but your goal is to really try to prevent the bilirubin from even reaching that level in the first place. Okay, so we mentioned physiologic jaundice a little bit earlier. So what does that mean? Physiologic jaundice is non-pathologic jaundice that is mild and transient and it occurs actually in a majority of newborns. And when examining a newborn, the goal is to try to differentiate physiologic jaundice from something that is pathologic. And there are some markers that you can look for to help you differentiate between the two. The first thing to know is that physiologic jaundice never, never, never occurs within the first 24 hours. That is a sign of pathologic jaundice if it does. Physiologic jaundice typically occurs on days 2 to 4. It peaks within 4 to 5 days and resolves by 1 to 2 weeks. Now you might be wondering, what causes physiologic jaundice? So there are actually a few different reasons. One reason is due to increased bilirubin production, and this is because newborns have more red blood cells, typically a hematocrit between 50 to 60%, which is a lot more than in adults. Along with this, fetal red blood cells have a shorter lifespan, so you have increased turnover and increased production of bilirubin as a result. A second reason is due to decreased clearance of bilirubin, and this is due to deficiency of UGT activity, and I will not try to pronounce the name of that enzyme because it is very long and that would be quite embarrassing. This enzyme is responsible for conjugation of bilirubin, which happens after hepatic uptake of unconjugated bilirubin and prior to biliary excretion of conjugated bilirubin. A third reason is increased enterohepatic circulation. If you recall from our previous video on hyperbilirubinemia, the secreted conjugated bilirubin cannot be reabsorbed by the intestinal epithelial cells. That conjugated bilirubin is then taken up by intestinal bacterial enzymes and converted into a form that can be excreted. However, at birth, an infant's gut is actually sterile as they have far fewer bacteria in the gut, so they have very little, if any, conjugated bilirubin that gets converted by this bacteria. What happens as a result is that that Conjugated bilirubin is then converted into unconjugated bilirubin by an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase in the intestinal mucosa. This unconjugated bilirubin is then reabsorbed through the intestinal wall and then recycled into the circulation. And this process is what is known as the enterohepatic circulation of bilirubin. Alright, let's now talk about pathologic jaundice, which as we mentioned before, occurs within 24 hours and actually rises very rapidly. Just like physiologic jaundice, pathologic jaundice can be due to one of three reasons, increased bilirubin production, decreased bilirubin clearance, and increased enterohepatic circulation. Let's start with increased bilirubin production, which can include ABO and RH incompatibility, leading to hemolytic disease of the newborn, as well as a cephalohematoma. This is when you have blood accumulating under the scalp as a result of trauma from the birthing process, and then that leads to breakdown of RBCs and heme formation and then conversion to bilirubin. Other causes include RBC membrane defects, which you can get with things like hereditary spherocytosis. Decreased clearance of bilirubin can occur with things like Jobert syndrome as well as Krigler and Ajar syndrome, which if you remember have to do with the UGT enzymes. And then increased enterohepatic circulation can occur with things like intestinal obstruction because you have a delay in excretion of bilirubin, as well as with things like breastfeeding jaundice and breast milk jaundice, which we'll talk about in the next slide. All right, so let's talk about breast milk jaundice and breastfeeding jaundice because these are often commonly tested questions and are important to know actually when examining a newborn. So breast milk jaundice is an interesting phenomenon. The exact mechanism is not completely understood, but it's thought to be due to the fact that human milk has high concentrations of beta-glucuronidase. 
And if you remember, beta-glucuronidase is the enzyme responsible for converting conjugated bilirubin to unconjugated bilirubin. In comparison, breastfeeding jaundice is thought to be due to poor breastfeeding, and as a result, you have slower bowel movements as well as slower elimination of bilirubin, leading to buildup. So in one case, you have difficulty with breastfeeding, and in the other case, you have an issue with the breast milk itself. So given this, with breast milk jaundice, the newborn often appears to be well hydrated and is feeding well, whereas with breastfeeding jaundice, the infant appears to be dehydrated and might even present with significant weight loss. In terms of timing, breast milk jaundice typically occurs after the first week, and breastfeeding jaundice typically occurs within the first week. And the way to remember this is that if a newborn is having difficulty with feeding, this will often present within the first week or early on, whereas if there's an issue with breast milk itself, it'll often present later. And the breastfeeding issue and breastfeeding jaundice typically occurs as a result of inadequate milk supply from mom's side, and this usually occurs early on. All right, so let's say you diagnose a patient with neonatal jaundice. When do we treat and when do we just observe? So this is actually a complicated question because it really depends on a number of factors like the infant's overall risk, their age, their gestational age, and their total bilirubin level. There are actually clinical decision-making tools available to determine when treatment needs to be initiated. But in a case in which a newborn actually needs treatment, the first-line therapy is known as phototherapy, which is where you direct UV light at a newborn in order to convert unconjugated bilirubin to water-soluble molecules that can be excreted. If phototherapy does not work, or if the baby is already symptomatic, or if the bilirubin level is extremely elevated, then there is also the possibility of undergoing an extremes transfusion, which is where you remove baby's blood and replace it with donor blood. This is to help get rid of the increased bilirubin in the blood. All right, that was a lot of information. Make sure to go back and review the slides now, as well as at a later time in order to really solidify your learning. But let's move on to a practice question. A five-day-old infant is brought into the office because of yellowing of the skin over the last two days. The child is awake, responsive, playful, and active. He is breastfed and has two to three daily bowel movements with brown stools. He is wetting seven to eight diapers per day every three to four hours. His abdomen is soft. He was delivered vaginally at full term. The mother did receive antibiotics for a positive culture before delivery. The blood group of the mother and the newborn is B positive. What is the most likely cause? All right, so let's review some aspects of this question to help us get to our answer. So time frame wise, we know that the jaundice began developing between three to five days of age and the child appears to be overall healthy, well-fed, and is making an appropriate number of wet and dirty diapers. His abdomen appears to be soft, and he's also forming brown stools, which we know is a good sign, which means that bilirubin is getting excreted into the stool. We are told that mom did receive antibiotics, likely for a positive GBS culture, but baby appears to be doing fine, so we're not as concerned about an infection here. So given all of this, there really is no significant red flag that's standing out, so this really appears to be more like physiologic jaundice. So the answer choice here is E. Biliary atresia would usually present with more pathologic jaundice, so early on within the first 24 hours, and the baby's stools would not be brown but acolic. Breastfeeding jaundice would be concerning if mom says she's not producing enough milk or if baby was not having a significant amount of wet and dirty diapers. Breast milk jaundice would be on the differential, but it typically presents after one week, so this doesn't really fit the time frame. And intestinal obstruction would be more likely if the baby's abdomen was not soft or if baby appeared to have pathologic jaundice, which was jaundice within the first 24 hours. All right, everyone, I hope you found this helpful. This topic is one that can often lead to a lot of confusion and it can be tested on exams. So make sure you understand this well. And if you have any questions, leave them down below. As always, please make sure to like and subscribe so that we can keep doing what we're doing. And as always, good luck studying, everyone.